Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children of all ages, I got something really exciting, so exciting that we had to bring him back twice. This is Colby Goodman, the jobhunter.com. When I talk about jobhunter.com, it's H-U-N-T-R. H-U-N-T-R, hunter.com. And I'm talking about Kobe's going to help you with a bunch of stuff. Resumes, interviews, LinkedIn, anything that has to do with networking. This man is incredible. has helped many, many people through their transition out of the military, law enforcement, and uh, federal careers. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children of all ages, I got something really exciting, so exciting that we had to bring him back twice. This is Colby Goodman, the jobhunter.com. When I talk about jobhunter.com, it's H-U-N-T-R, H-U-N-T-R, hunter.com. And I'm talking about Colby's going to help you with a bunch of stuff, resumes, interviews, LinkedIn, anything that has to do with networking. This man is incredible, has helped many, many people through their transition out of the military, law enforcement, and uh, federal careers. I'm really excited to have Mr. Colby, and by the way, really funny spelling. I got to tell you, Colby, K-O-L-B-Y, Goodman.com, the coolest guy on earth. What is up, brother? How are you? How are you today? I mean, obviously, you're doing great. What else is new? I, I appreciate uh, you having me back. Uh, you have many members of the Two Timers Club here on the podcast. No, as a matter of oh. fact, I, I literally have one, one other person that I've that, that I've done it twice because we we're talking about family and how important okay. it is to include to that self assessment of family in your transition. Make sure that they're okay and they're they're on the boat with you once again. And since family is important to a lot of us, and you got a new, you know, a new new baby uh, boy. I, there, right? Yeah, yeah. You and I, you and I are having, I think, combined maybe thirty minutes of sleep a night at this point, right? Yeah, yeah. So you know, families. <laughs> important but this is also important because uh the job hunter and you help everybody out with resumes interviews uh, a lot of the linkedin stuff man and most importantly as you know networking so i'm why don't you just kick it off man introduce yeah. to the folks a little bit of tell them a little bit about yourself and let's get it yeah rolling. i appreciate it i mean i've since the last time i was on your podcast talking about resume development i've had dozens literally dozens of, of your listeners reach out to me for help and they've seen some amazing changes in their search they've been able to get more interviews land better offers make these career transitions that really help feed their life transitions i think that's a big thing especially for a lot of your listeners is you know law enforcement military federal jobs they don't necessarily have the best work-life balance or allow you you know your best life at home when you're not at work and so a lot of my clients that come to me are looking for that balance and looking for that shift are wanting more out of their life and need to make a shift in their in their careers, but just don't know how to do it, right? When you've been a career police a policeman, when you've you know risen through the ranks of the military, you're you got your blinders on. You just don't know any better. And I'm here to help those individuals to get a broader sense of how to market self into a private industry, how to go from you know, a public entity to a business asset, which I see all my clients as, and to take away a lot of the guesswork and remove a lot of the headache and pain points of how the heck do you write a resume in 2022, yeah. right? Like so much has changed and maybe you've never had to write a resume. Maybe right. you've always been commended for your on the job work so that you've been promoted time and time again. But now that you have to actively market yourself as a candidate in this new realm, how do you go about it effectively? And that's where I come in to help a lot of my clients to demystify the work, to do the work for them, because writing your own resume is just a big pain in the butt. So taking away that 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 issue and and working with them to interview and tell stories well so that right. they can make this transition in their career as quickly as possible. Dude, you just you just hit something that I thought was really, really interesting right off the get-go, as you always, always do, my friend. I usually tell people we're going from like this this uh, kind of government to private. 
And you just mm -hmm. said, we're going to make the human beings a private entity mm -hmm. because they're coming from the government. It's almost like you're transitioning their mind and who they are to understand that they are a private entity and they can yeah. do their own thing. So that's that's huge, man. I like that. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to yeah. steal that from you, by the way. Please. It's all yours, man. All right. Here we go. But listen, so we talked a lot about different things. And one of the things that we mentioned earlier was how early should these people be thinking about this transition? Mm -hmm. How early should they be pushing for, you know, hey, let, let me get my mind set for that? Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's, I don't think you can start early enough, honestly, right? Because one thing that I have seen with my clients first, and it's something that I've dealt with just my entire life uh, as a child, as an adult, is that patience isn't really my virtue. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I think a lot of people, their patients are tested throughout this process. It's a, probably the number one question that I get is, how long should I expect my job search to take? And I said, if, if I knew the answer to that, I would be able to charge the moon and back, yeah. right? But because it's this kind of uh, undelineated timeline, Starting as early as possible is always in your best interest. Yeah. So even if you're, you know, years away, having some of these, you know, tricks and tips and mindset shifts that we're going to obviously get into today on this podcast on board will make it so that when you're ready to make that transition, you've done a lot of the legwork and the, you know, the built up a lot of good momentum so that you're not starting from zero. Got it. Got it. I agree. I agree. And it's it's interesting to me. Some folks are getting it. Some folks are like, you know, I'm going to start thinking about 10 years out, five years out. In the beginning, when, we, you know, I kind of started this venture, there's a lot of people like, hey, yesterday, I need help yesterday. <laughs> but I think people are realizing, especially I'm going to say in the law enforcement world, because it's been very tough in the law enforcement sure. world for folks here in the last two, two and a half, three years, that they literally were like, okay, I'm going to start thinking now mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, it's it's become really difficult to do this. So, I love that, man. I love that. And what you're doing then is helping them even, to, are, they, are you setting them up for success in their latter years to, to get better? Because we also talked about, and I'm going to jump some things here if you don't yeah, mind. Yeah, sorry, go for it. But as, as now you're thinking about transition earlier and earlier and earlier in your prior career, what are some of the things that you think they should be doing while at that career yeah. to prepare themselves for success in the next one? Yeah, so a big the big problem when you spend a long time doing a very certain set of things, right. Is that the expertise that you've built up as a law enforcement agent, you know, as somebody in the military, as a military leader, as a, you know, a federal employee is that your, the expertise that you built up now looks and feels easy. And that perspective makes you ultimately an extremely poor self promoter. Oh yeah. <laughs> and so the goal is to get, perspective right um, because we live in our own heads 24 hours a day seven days a week we can't we need to get different people's experiences and perspectives of how we work and most importantly the impact that we're able to have yeah so one kind of magic question i encourage all professionals who are out there and ask the people around them is simply this how have i been able to help you and i like this question for a few reasons one is that um, it is very personal, right? You're not asking about how did I help you on that project or how have I helped you on this initiative or on that case, right? So how have I helped you in general? Wow. And the other outcome of this question is it primarily isn't things that are technically sound, your day-to-day. -day. It is how you help people feel, what you help them accomplish, how you help them get through their own hangups and their own challenges. And that's where a lot of my clients get a lot of wins when they tell these stories in their next career because as you sell yourself into a private entity a lot more of the soft skills comes into play yeah right because you're dealing with all kinds of different people from all kinds of different ways maybe you lose your authority as a police person and you go into you know, a for-profit entity right and so emotional intelligence and people influence is really important and if you're not aware about how you do it and then digging into the why are you capable of doing it in that way, then you can't get other people to trust you to do their job, to do a job for them. Right, right. I think I think it's key. So it's funny because I'm just watching. 
actually not not watching. I'm a listener. By the way, my book is out on Audible. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I am a listener of, of books, and uh, right now I'm watching. I'm, I'm listening to one on Benjamin Franklin, and Benjamin Franklin mm-hmm. said, "Your uh, your own experiences alone are not enough to make you an educated man," and mm-hmm. that's something I said a long time ago. So asking the question, "How have I helped you?" It's crazy because now you're going to gather a lot of other stuff from what other people are singing about yourself. You know, he meant it as reading a lot of books because you can live yep. your life. You can learn a lot from other people's experiences. But this is also setting you up for success through other people's experiences of you. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's and by going straight to those sources, your peers, your bosses, your employees, you're then able to speak to the next round of people who are that your next boss. Hey, let me tell you at a time how I, I was able to help my boss in this way. Let me tell you how I help my clients doing that, or my client or my employees doing this, yeah. right? Like, so you give parallels to the people that you're talking to to get them to empathize and sympathize with your abilities and to get them again to trust you. That's the, I think that's the biggest thing here is that in order to be hired, you can't just be good, you gotta be likable and you gotta be trustable. Trustworthy, man. I just saw a study about that too where the biggest thing in the corporate business today is who can I trust? It's not really much about everything, but if I think the study, I got I to gotta go look it up where it is. I just pull these things out of nowhere sometimes. But uh, trust was like the number one key. Uh, and I think it was a study done. Was it uh, Navy SEALs? I don't even know. Okay. It, was, it was trust. Trust was key, which also translated to the corporate world. They said the same mm-hmm. thing. So there you go, man. Yeah. So, and this, so that's kind of part of it is like again, getting that perspective, right? Because that's important because that's going to help you sell yourself moving forward. And then what's nice now is that in your, what next I want these, your listeners to do is to go forward and say, okay, what are, what are the things that I want to be doing next? And how can I do those things now? Since you've already built up that trust, you already have momentum drawn, since you're already in the role that you're in. How do you kind of branch out from your typical day to day to get your hands dirty in the thing you want to do next, right? Yeah. Community outreach, training and development, hiring and onboarding, the things that you are interest you, you can, you know, ask permission to do those things now. Yeah. Um, and I would argue that your employer is going to be gleeful that you're asking for more responsibility um, because they, they need the bodies, right? Absolutely. And so, and so by putting yourself out there and branching out beyond your typical day-to-day or what's on your job description, it gives you opportunities to get more experience, which is always important. But I think beyond that is that it also helps you identify what you do want to do next and what you absolutely want to stay the heck away from next. Right. And before you commit to a whole new job and shifting your whole life and job, make sure that you actually want to do it and you're not just in love with the idea of it. And so if you can take those baby steps now and get that exposure and that experience that helps you position yourself more effectively moving forward. Yeah. So I'm going to go back a little bit then. Okay. So people in the military law enforcement, we honestly believe that, you know, we, we are, the, we, we just want to help. We don't want to ask mm-hmm. for anything. We don't want to ask for favors. We don't want to ask for opportunities. We're really there for the public and to help and to give and to give and to give and to mm-hmm. give and never take, we never take. That's mm-hmm. not what we do. When when everybody's at home hanging out with their families in the holidays, we're there to work and protect you. When everybody's having a good time in their Sunday barbecue, we're there working and protecting you. So how do you change people's minds, man, if they got five years left or something like that to start asking and not be afraid to ask for those training opportunities or new work opportunities mm-hmm. to grow their resume and their mind? How do you change people's minds, man? Um, I, I, I don't. I think you've kind of already said it. It's not about, hey, I want this, I want this opportunity. It says, hey, how can I contribute by doing this new kind of work? By you going to help train the new guy, right? Mm-hmm. You're ultimately helping. You're contributing back into it. And yes, ultimately it does have a long-term semi-selfish play, but you're continuing to add value in the present, right? Yeah. And ultimately, it's funny you say that, like this mindset of wanting to help and contribute. That's how I coach my clients I'm interviewing, right? It's not about, this is what I can do. It's about, this is how I can help. Yeah. This is how I can alleviate those pain points. This is how I can solve those problems. This is how I can execute on those opportunities. And it's always about the other person. And so mm-hmm. as you go out there and ask for more opportunity, make sure in that conversation, you're saying, hey, I wanna, I wanna, you know, I wanna lead the new post training. 
yeah. right? And you say, oh, I can do that to, I can help onboard more people so we can have more cops on the streets, or I can help modernize our programming so that the content sticks better. And so, yes, while you're gaining that experience, you're selling yourself off to the opportunity by saying, this is how I know my contributions is going to help the team as a whole. Absolutely. And I always tell people, those who don't ask, don't get. Uh, mm. It's a very Southern thing to say, but it is true. <laughs> if you don't ask, you don't get. And um, a lot of times we forget. We're just so focused on our work and what we do. And like I said, we, we don't want to ask for anything. But if you don't, if you don't let the people that can help you out, make them aware, right, that, that you're looking, uh, you're not going to find it. So you got to make them aware. I think that's a big point, too, because I think as much as people feel vulnerable asking for help, right, because it is a vulnerable thing. You're, you're, oh, yeah. you're stating oh. you're admitting weakness. You're admitting maybe you're less than um, and you can't do it on your own, which yeah. are all. Big yes, no-nos in our field. Yes, it's the yes. big no-nos in our field, man. We just don't do that. And so I think people, that's one part of the, the spectrum. But the other part is people, I think, generally do want to help. But I also argue that it is equally as vulnerable to offer help as it is to ask for it. Because if you offer it and you're rejected, people take offense to the help or the support. It's like, well, I don't want to do, I don't want to put myself in that situation. And so these two people, you know, it's like, it's like a middle school dance. Everybody's on the walls. Everybody's too scared to talk to each other. And so if you can cross the boundary and express vulnerability first and say, hey, like, I need help. This is how I think you can help me. This is why I think you're the right person. It gets people to to want to help and contribute to you even more. My God. And, you know, and I'll tell you something else, and I'm going to get into the mind of these people right now for <laughs> you. Because they think, well, I don't want to be the teacher's pet, and I don't want to be the one, you know, because then people are saying, oh, you, you're a brown noser. Right? Like, mm, we almost go back politics. to high school. Yeah, yeah, you know, the politics behind it. But look, man, you got to look out for yourself. And honestly, you're just trying to do the best to, 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 to better yourself. And a lot of times, you just can't really think about what other people think. And trust me, leadership will love your support. They mm -hmm. don't usually get it. My mom used to say, those who are open to change are the future leaders of tomorrow. So every time leaders come to mm. you for change and stuff like that, if you embrace those changes as, as a leader too, that helps them. But, um, but hey, okay, so cool. So now you're thinking about, you, you, you're asking for help and, and now you're getting closer and closer. But I always talk about, especially chapter one, I started my book with chapter one, which was taking stock. You have mm -hmm. to know who mm -hmm. you are. And I always say, are you too rigid? Or do you have the, the old white glove skills? Or the, <laughs> you know, those kinds of things. When you're talking about taking stock of where you are, where you want to go, you mentioned a little bit about know the company you, you actually want to go work for. Not mm -hmm. just uh, don't think of it, like don't dream about it. Go ask people about it. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about your concept on that, man, and how, how you help the folks through it. So ultimately what I walk my clients through is kind of reversing the funnel a bit. Technically, people go out and look for work. They go to Indeed, they go to LinkedIn, they type in a job title and they get this never ending list of results, yeah. right? That process is overwhelming. It, it is kind of ineffective. And ultimately it prioritizes the most important thing last because ultimately people are looking to make a change because they want a culture shift. They want to be a part of a team, a part of an environment that more aligns with who they are. But if you're prioritizing the job title first, you're ultimately prior, you're, you're putting the, the, the company and what they do and who they serve totally last. So instead of going out there, stop looking on Indeed, stop looking on LinkedIn, go out there and look for the company first. Identify your top five to 10 organizations that you really resonate with, with what they do, who they serve, what they sell, what they, what they stand for. Right. And then from there, once you've identified some key organizations, then go into the careers page, the career page of their website and see what they currently have available. Now, typically what we, what we do as professionals is we look at a job posting and we ask ourselves, how, how do I qualify? Am I qualified? Do I check enough boxes? And the answer is always going to be no. <laughs> Unless you're literally looking to do the exact same thing you're doing now, the answer is going to be no. But ultimately, a manager worth their salt, a leader who has... Uh, good capabilities to mold and to evolve a team isn't looking just for qualification. They're looking for impact. And so what I want your listeners to do when they find a job at a company they really like, instead of asking yourself, do I qualify? Which is this very binary yes or no answer, which can easily be enough punches in the gut to make you stop looking. Ask yourself, 
how can I add the most value by doing this kind of work? Wow. I agree. <laughs> I agree. We just don't do that. No. We don't do that. And then sometimes we even try to fake it by trying to copy and paste exactly what it is in that job description. You got to tell a story, man. Yeah, I always say the job description is like my problem as a company. Here's my problem as a company. And and please be my answer because I want to hire the person that's going to be my answer. I don't need you to do exactly like those because those things might be very specific to my company. Mm -hmm. But if if I can sense in an interview that you're covering those things through what you're telling me, you're my answer. The, you took it right on my mouth, man. It's, it's about going from, I can do the job to I can solve your problem. Ah. And that's what you want. You want to be a problem solver. It's, I mean, ultimately it kind of boils down to consumer behavior, right? Economics class of, of high school and college is that if you, I think what I'm going to challenge your listeners to do from here on out in the next few days, look at all the marketing that's geared towards you. Yeah. I guarantee you that a vast majority of it is trying to help you relieve pain rather than enhance pleasure. And that's what you should be doing in your job search. How do I go out there and identify the problems, the issues, and the opportunities that my next employer is having? And how can I present myself as somebody who can address all those quickly, efficiently, and ideally with profitable results. Yeah. God, Jesus, man. Absolutely. Let me see. Let me see. <laughs> no, no, that's not the one. No. This one. This one right here. Yeah, no, I have multiple buttons, but this one. <laughs> this one is the one I was looking for. So, uh, man, listen, incredible. That's also money. Money, you know. So, yeah. So, I'm going to uh, pause it for a minute. But that's the other thing, too, is that by – Showcasing yourself as a problem solver, as somebody you can value add and somebody who has positive return on investment, you then get to ask for more value in return, uh, which means higher pay, more opportunity, better training, better benefits, equity, remote, hybrid. You can ask for the moon from any employer as long as you present enough value to cover that ask. I think it's where a lot of people tend to falter is that they look at this, this, the salary negotiation part of the, of the process and wait till the end. No, no, no. Start, start your argument and your persuasion of why you deserve what you're going to ask for in that initial touch point, in that application. So that when you ask for the money at the end, it's totally obvious and apparent why you deserve it. I love it. I love it. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you, there's some issues out there. Some issues mm -hmm. out there, Kobe. And you might be able to help the listeners out. And I think, uh, you, I think you got, look, this is the deal. They can't tell me the story, man. I'll ask them. I'll ask them a question in the interview, and they just can't. They don't have that library of examples mm -hmm. that they can pull from to get it to just get it. Now, I I know a lot of times what they do. I, I grew up in the industry. I know what the mm -hmm. military folks. I know what they do. Law enforcement, federal folks, but they just can't pull out stories that that connect back to me, the interviewer. What do you think about this library of examples kind of deal, man? How do you, how do you go about that? Yeah, I think the problem, so what I would argue is that there isn't a lack of stories. There's, there's too much volume of them. Oh, and they can't sell themselves either. I, one of the things that so, I learned about my folks, we cannot sell ourselves. Yeah. Right. So, so two parts there. So one is volume of, of stories, right? Yeah. An issue isn't a lack of them. It's an issue to recall them. Our brains, it's funny, like. I can recall like jingles from ads from my childhood, but I don't remember what I had for lunch three days ago, right? Our brains are fickle. They, they're an important organ, but they're not the most efficient right. in our bodies. Right. So the goal is how do, you, how do you offload the need to remember? And it simply, what I recommend is doing like a weekly work journal. So every, whatever your Friday is of your week, send yourself an email, title it, you know, stats report for, you know, Friday the 3rd. In the body of the email, um, you're going to write five wins from the week. And those would be sentences, bullets, just really light things. And then five lessons learned. You hit send, send it to yourself. You hit send, you put it away. And then when you start to start to prepare for interviews, you open this up and you have weeks, months, years worth of story examples that you give your brain enough of a string to pull that you're going to, I'm going to actually remember. Wow. Yeah. Right. It's something that I did, I started to do in my first job right after college. 
I was killing it at my first job. I was in, I was doing help desk support. I was, I was, you know, I was resetting the passwords, not a super glorious uh, job, <laughs> right, right. but I was good at it. People liked me. I was, had good numbers. So I came back around a year later and I asked my boss for a raise. And I said, I've done this and this and this, and I've, I've had this kind of impact. And she said, great. Can you show me? And that's kind of where my argument died on the vine. I didn't have any evidence. I didn't have any proof. And it wasn't that it didn't happen. It's that I couldn't recall it and I couldn't remember it. So this is when I started this practice of this work journal, right? Let's write it down because I, as we've proven, I don't have a great memory. Let's write it down so that it, it lives somewhere offline in my brain that I can bring up regularly. So that's one easy five minute a week tactic that your, your listeners can use to start collecting really good stories. I love that. Now, the second half of what you said is, well, how do you translate those stories in a way that some people want to listen, <laughs> right? <laughs> how do you be interesting in telling the story? What I have found is people are focusing primarily on plot. Uh, a happens, and then B happens, and then C happens, and then D was the end, right? Nobody really cares about plot, especially in this instance, right? They right. care about character, because and you're the main character. Yeah. And so what you need to be doing is telling more about how you felt and how you thought, how that influenced your action. What I'm, you know, the analogy I use is the interview process is like trying to get married after the second date. That's right. And so, um, and because you cannot run every single hypothetical that you could ever encounter with somebody to a partner in those two sessions, what you have to do is you have to understand their operating system their logic, their thought process. And so the more that you can share about that in an interview, it gets people to open up to you. It gets people to trust you. And it gives them a foundation of how you're going to be no matter what the situation. Wow. It's funny that you say that. I think it has always worked for me, Kobe, because working for the Walt Disney Company for as long as I did, mm -hmm. storytelling, mm -hmm. right? And breaking down the individual character is so important that I think that's why I've always done well in interviews. And, and here I am, right, doing this. I mean, we're just throwing this up in the air and making it happen. But I think <laughs> I think these things are important, and that's definitely something that the folks can, can hone in and learn. Is that something they can learn or put together? Absolutely. I mean, I encourage my clients to tell these stories as if they're telling them to a friend, right? You want to be conversational. You want to be personable. And with the effective storytelling, you know, what I recommend is going out there and listening to good stories, right? Like, so I love, one one big thing my wife and I do on long road trips is we listen to audio books like you do, yep. um, from books written by comedians and entertainers who read their own books, right? So uh, Steve Martin, his Born Setting Up book is amazing. It's great, and he's telling it. He's given the inflection, he's giving the insight. Seth Rogen's put a pretty funny book that is definitely not suitable for all ages that I'd also recommend. Right. But it gives you an understanding of how people are entertaining by telling about things from their own lives. And it primarily comes in what you think and what you feel, how that influences action, um, how you come up against adversity. Because what it allows you to do by sharing those things, it gets people to empathize and connect with you. Um, and ultimately, too, in interviews, too, talking about your flaws is important, which could be a whole nother podcast we can do down the road. But um, it's about if you can share your insight, if you can share the way that you tick and why you know you tick like that, it gets people engaged with you more. And you can leverage micro stories. You can leverage one project, one case, one you know boss as a micro example about how you work on the macro. Yeah. Yeah, man, that sounded beautiful. I'm in, I'm in bro. You're hired. You're hired, buddy. <laughs> just clap it up one more time for you, buddy. Clap it up. All the stuff that we talked about, just big money as well. But listen, Kobe, we're slowly, you know, 30 minutes go by fast. In this yeah, world. too fast. You know, too fast for us. But I want people to know about you and what you do, and how I can get a hold of you. So yeah. please, me amigo, finish this <laughs> out, and maybe give last last hint or two. Sure. Um, I mean, you can find me, probably the best way to get a hold of me is LinkedIn, Colby Goodman, K-O-L-B-Y, last name Goodman. 
G-O-O-D-M-A-N. It's where a lot of people have found me. A lot of Carlos's listeners have reached out to me directly. Actually, I had a call with one of your listeners earlier today who's going to come on board and help him with um, his resume as he gets into corporate security as he leaves mm-hmm. a long uh, two-decade career in uh, law enforcement. Um, so if you need help with your resume, if you don't know, you know how to write a cover letter, if your LinkedIn looks pretty plain and bare, if you can't tell a story to get out of your way of a paper bag, reach out. I'm, I'm here to help. There is re- you know, I'm a resource that can be here for you to demystify, to be a resource, to, I think, encourage you and help you regain the confidence and the excitement to look for new work, right? I, you mentioned it, you know, mentioned it before, is like the desire to escape is important. It's a good catalyst. But if you're not clear what that North Star is from you, if you don't know what target you're shooting at, to use a very prominent example for your listeners, you're going to miss. Yeah. So let's get you clear. Let's get you with the right tools. And let's get you, let me be a partner with you in this process so that you don't feel like you're going about it alone and with little results. Uh-huh. So I'm here to help. And I think that's, maybe it's a good segue into my last big thing is, we talked about it before, but I'm going to double down on it, is ask for help ask like you said it, it those who who get the most support ask and that's the big thing is that you're not weak you're not less than you don't you don't have to know you're not stupid for not knowing right the easiest quickest and cheapest way to learn is from somebody else yep so go out and do it as little as you know make it as little as how i've been able to help you right that's asking for help it's helping for understanding or something as big as Come to somebody like myself or going to your captain and asking for new responsibilities. Like everything in that is important. And the quicker you pull off that band aid of the fear and the anxiety of asking for help, the easier it becomes. And one thing I learned that I've continued to learn is the more ask you help for, the more help you get, and the easier things become. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> so, everybody, that was Colby Goodman. Now, again, you got to go check it out. The Job Hunter himself going out there and helping everybody. We talk, look, we, I took a lot of notes. We got resumes, interviews, LinkedIn, network, thinking about starting things early, library of examples, training at work for your future, additional responsibilities. We covered so many things. And my favorite one, how have I been able to help you? Colby, you killed it today, buddy. I truly appreciate it. Thank you once again for coming out. Everybody from me, Carlos the corporate security translator and the author of this little book right here. So you want to get into corporate security? Yeah. Keep it right there, buddy. Now, now on audible, you said, right? Yeah. Oh, audible on audible as well. So from Kobe and I, everybody have a good one. Take care. And we'll catch you next time. We'll see you. Bye-bye.